folks, welcome to the Power of Zero show. I am your host, your loyal and faithful host, David McKnight, uh, author of uh, best-selling book, Power of Zero, Look Before You Lerp, The Volatility Shield, and Tax-Free Income for Life, all of which can be uh, bought in bulk at davidmcknightbooks.com. And of course, they can be bought in single copies anywhere you buy fine books, including Amazon. Um, If you are Looking for someone to help you navigate all of the pitfalls that stand between you and the 0% tax bracket, you can head over to davidmcknight.com. Happy to hook you up with a member of our elite POZ advisor group among the very top uh, financial planners in the country, particularly when it comes to mitigating longevity risk and tax rate risk within the very same financial plan. And if you are a financial advisor who wants to internalize all of these things and get them integrated into your financial practice, head over to powerofzero.com. This week, we are going to be listening to part two of my interview with William Warren Fairfield professor at Boston University, Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. Uh, Once again, it's a wide-ranging discussion, uh, all of which are very, very much in line with Power of Zero principles and the types of uh, issues that we frequently address on this podcast. So sit back, relax, take a listen to the second half of my interview with Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. We recently had uh, former Comptroller General David Walker on the podcast, and of course, his new book is America in 2040, Still a Superpower. So he's looking out over the arc of 20 years, and the main thesis of his book is that if we stay on our current fiscal course in 2040, we will no longer be a superpower. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a book called uh, Prosperity in the Age of Decline. Last week, we had the author on our podcast. His name is Brian Bolu and his brother, Alan Bolu. And they are predicting in their book, uh, which they wrote back in 2015, and they're standing by this prediction even more now than they were uh, when they wrote the book. Um, They are predicting due to this confluence of you know, the aging demographics of our country, the burgeoning debt, the the un... um, you know, the um, unfunded obligations for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the national debt, all those are going to create the perfect storm in 2030 that will precipitate the greatest depression that we've seen since the 30s. Um, Any thought on that prediction? Is that over the top or could you see a scenario like that playing out starting on or about 2030? Well, I I could see that starting tomorrow or today. Because we have the, you know, if you look at the country objectively, uh, uh, we're not going to be the dominant economic power. China's GDP is already uh, the same size as ours. They're uh, catching up in terms of productivity. So by the end of the century, uh, in a study that I'm working on now with some co-authors, uh, we predict that the U.S. will have uh, will have about 12%, 11% of world GDP. We now have about 15%. China will have go from about 15% to about 26% of world GDP, be about twice as big as our country. Um, other countries are going to expand in terms of their share of GDP, like India. And um, uh, so the US, Europe, Japan, uh, they're going to shrink in terms of their... So this is... Um, under really a good scenario about the, the fiscal policy and then uh, getting control of it. If you continue to act irresponsibly, uh, things get even worse. So, uh, and that's the share of GDP. If you look at a lot of our GDP now and in the future will be produced using foreign capital. So foreigners say, well, Americans aren't saving enough to invest in their country. Let's invest here in the US. Well, we, you know, we say, okay, we've got, a big GDP, or we have a higher GDP because of that, but it's not, they're getting the asset income or the, the return on that capital. Americans aren't. So our share of national income is going to be even smaller. Uh, well, na- a global national income, which is global wages plus asset income. Uh, so we're not, it's not looking good in terms of the projection. So I would agree. And then will this uh, manifest itself in terms of a, 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 major recession, depression, uh, that takes a little more doing. I mean, that takes uh, some sudden things that happen and uh, uh, some shocks. Like in 2008, everybody thought the financial system was collapsing. 
and they all panicked collectively, and we uh, we had right. mass layoffs. That could happen in this context. We could see interest rates jump up overnight. We could see prices jump up, and the one will reinforce the other. So it could be like a vicious cycle for a bit. So um, you know, when people realize that the Fed is not uh, all powerful, uh, then um, you know. The Fed, the Fed will not be able to control this. You know, the, Jerome Powell is a lovely guy and a smart person, and he's doing his best for the country. But the idea that uh, that he's ca conveying that he can just uh, keep interest rates this low and print money at the wazoo to cover these deficits and have no ramifications forever, well, uh, that's that's just simply not the case. There's just too many. Uh, too many examples in the course of history, 22 hyperinflations in 22 countries in the last century that just uh, refute that proposition that you can, yeah. that this is all free. So, so, so um, David Walker talks about what we're really experiencing in our country right now is a crisis of leadership. Uh, someone that, that, you know, a politician that would step up and, and sort of just lay bare what our economic situation really is and that we have to make some really hard decisions uh, which would involve raising taxes, reducing spending, some combination of the two. And that what we're really, we have a sort of this deficit of, of leadership. Um, assuming we could get, assuming you know Americans could be aroused to their faculties and, and recognize exactly what's at stake and put the right people, right kind of politicians into office, that could make these tough decisions. Are we already beyond the point of no return? Has the debt gotten so big that it's snowballing that um, it's sort of leading us inexorably to this really, really bad place? Or is there still time to right the ship? I mean, I think there's still uh, time. Uh, David's a great guy and uh, an old, old friend, and I hope he runs for president on a third party ticket. I'd be happy to be his vice president. Um, <laughs> I think I'll be. Um, I might I might be old enough at that uh, in a couple of years to do that. I'm too young right now, but um, apparently. But uh, I I think what we need is to have an independent party and people like David and people like me getting you know uh, potentially running in um, for these uh, positions and and maybe at least having a getting enough attention to get a conversation going. Uh, but we need to. You know, I ran for president in 2016 as an independent and right. uh, as a writing candidate. And I had to register across the country. Uh, so I was one of five people that were legally able to get elected. And the press paid no attention because I didn't have, uh, you know, a billion dollars. If I had a billion dollars, I might have been president, you know, because they, you know, it's like, you know, chicken and egg thing. If you had... If you had the billion, then you get other people to contribute, like you know, like Trump did, basically spend other people's money to become president. Now, um, uh, in the what I did uh, when I ran was to write a uh, platform. This was the main reason for running, which was to lay out what I think economists, because I spoke to a lot of economists at the time, think we should do to fix. The banking system to think health, fix healthcare, to fix uh, social security, to fix uh, the tax system, because one of the problems we're facing right now is very high uh, work disincentives associated with not just paying taxes but losing benefits if you work more. You know, I, I don't know if you know, but I did a study. It's on my Kotlikoff.net website. Uh, it's called about the with Alan Auerbach actually uh, called the uh, and, and uh, uh, a student of mine. Uh, uh, called the marginal taxation of Americans, uh, and it shows that uh, roughly a quarter of people that are poor are facing marginal taxes above 70 cents on the dollar. So you take the poor people in our country and say, look, if you earn another dollar, you're going to lose 70 cents of that. A quarter of these people are going to lose 70 cents or more because they're going to lose so much in food stamps, so much in uh, welfare benefits, so much in housing support, so much in health, Medicare, Obamacare subsidies go away, 
uh, they have to pay payroll taxes, sales taxes, state income taxes. You put it all together, you're in that kind of bracket. And so we have to get everybody, uh, give everybody an incentive. And so we need to have much uh, more, uh, a much uh, simpler and uh, uh, straightforward fiscal system. And that's what I helped design in this in this book called uh, this platform, which is uh, a book now on my website that you can download at kotlikoff.net. It's called You're Hired. So it's not You're Fired. I, the, the week that Trump was elected, I printed, put it out as a book. The platform, I made it into a book and I said, OK, anybody can download it for free. And it says what to do to fix their, each of these problems. And it's not, not just my view. It's Alan Auerbach's view. It's top healthcare um, economist view, but it's, they're very simple so solutions to each problem. And so if we did those things, I think we could get our ship righted uh, and and get back and and have a have a decent future. But given the way we're, you know, we don't have a single PhD economist in Congress. We don't have anybody uh, we don't have, we're not calculating the fiscal gap as a gap as a country at the CBO. I went down and have talked to re, successive chairman of the, the CBO, heads of the CMO, CBO, and they refuse to do the analysis. Mm. And unions doing it because they're pol politicians. You know, they don't want to upset members of Congress. There was a bill that I uh, helped write um, called the Inform Act, which eight senators sponsored. Co it was a bipartisan bill to get the CBO, to force the CBO and the GAO and OMB to do fiscal gap accounting every uh, every year. And that bill only got, only garnered a support of seven senator, eight, eight senators. Hmm. So, you know, what, what, what can we say here? The, uh, uh, this is, you know, you're on the Titanic and you've got somebody drilling holes in the, in the bottom. <laughs> and rearranging deck chairs, right. So, um, my final question has to do with taxing the rich. Uh, Maya McGinnis over at the Committee for Responsible Federal uh, Budget, who will be on our uh, show in the next few weeks, she has um, did a study a couple years ago where she basically said, look, if we want to just simply prevent the, the debt from growing at more than a trillion dollars per year, at what rate would we have to tax those who make more than $400,000? And she basically concluded, every dollar that they made above $400,000, they'd have to tax at 103%. And then she said, well, that's obviously not viable. So let's lower it down to 250,000. What would we have to make? Uh, what do we have to tax those making more than 250,000? It went down to 80%. I mean, the, the long and the short of it was she, she just felt like to sort of right our ship of state, we're gonna have to get more people paying taxes, not just the top. We're just going to have to broaden the, the, the tax base. Do you have an opinion on how the tax system needs to be reformed so that we can be more viable over a longer period of time? Yeah, uh, I do. And it's in this book, uh, you know, You're Hired, which again, is at kotlikoff.net. It's a free download. I just click on books. The So I would put in place, uh, I'd make the payroll tax. We want to have a low marginal rate uh, so that everybody has an incentive to work, the poor, the rich, the middle class. And in my proposal, I give everybody, uh, put everybody into a 30% work marginal tax bracket. And, uh, but we also wanna have a progressive system uh, right. so, that, so that the poor are differentially helped so that their average tax is lower than it is for the rich, but the marginal tax is the same. So this requires some, you know, uh, good design, uh, efficient design. And what I'm proposing is a payroll tax that starts around $40,000, exempts the first $40,000, uh, a value-added tax, which is a consumption tax, and uh, also a uh, cash flow uh, progressive consumption tax that... Um, and if you put these things together, I think you can get plus an inheritance tax that you can get. Uh, and you also reform some of these welfare programs in a way that we don't, you know, tax people if they earn more money by saying we're going to take away your benefits. And so you have to do a bunch of things to, 
simultaneously, but you can, I think, uh, get the fiscal gap under control. I mean, a big part of this is reforming healthcare, so we're not spending 18% of GDP as a nation, but more like 13%. That's 5%. You know, I said we have an 8% of GDP problem, right? If we get 4% of the GDP uh, out of fixing healthcare, and whether it's Bernie Care or uh, Medicare Part C for All, which is what I favor, which is Medicare for All, but the Part C version, which is the competitive version, mm -hmm. the Advantage Plan for All, we can get uh, down to 14% of GDP rather than 18% and give everybody a good, very good healthcare system uh, and end up spending more still as a share of GDP than any country in the world. So there are things we can do. Uh, we just need to have some intelligent design. And we're, <laughs> uh, you know, we've got a terrific Treasury Secretary, and I'm hoping, hopeful that um, you know, she isn't a PhD economist. She was my my professor, actually, uh, Alan's as well, because we were in class together with her, Janet Yellen. I'm hoping that Janet will come up with um, some good proposals through time to. But we need to think out of the, bo the box here. We're kind of in a bad bad place. We need to square with the, pu the public about how deep the hole is. And I don't see anybody talking about that. Uh, and I hope that Biden will pivot and start saying, look, here's some problems we haven't addressed that we have to address. And here's why we need universal health care reform, because we're otherwise going broke. So I think Bernie Bill was actually uh, a very... You know, which is me traditional Medicare for all, basically, um, uh, even if it may not be that it'll be better care for more people than what we now have, because we have a lot of people under 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 cared. And uh, uh, that would be what we now have. I think we can do even better with Medicare Part C for all. But either either of these plans can be fiscally conservative. So we have to start thinking about the path of spending and understand that uh, uh, and then you have to do it in a way that doesn't pull the rug out from anybody you know you're an employer employee you're in this plan well I say fine if you're in General Motors plan you've got a great health care plan fine General Motors has to make it available to anybody who wants to join join the plan if they want to be in the health insurance business they can't exclude anybody so G GM keep your plan for your workers but let other people who are not your workers join that's what I would say. So that's an, an example of thinking out of the box. Uh, how can you transition from where we are to where we need to be without shutting down plans or disconnecting people from their doctors? Well, there are ways to do it. It, see, it seems to me like there's a lot of good ideas out there. You have great ideas. David Walker has great ideas. Um, you see some independent parties that have good ideas. But it seems to me that those great ideas are great so long as somebody acts upon them right now, but that every year that goes by where we fail to take action, some sort of action, any action at all, really, uh, means that our choices become more and more narrower as time goes along. This debt snowball just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so our options start to narrow. Is that sort of how you see it? Yeah, it's like um, global warming. The longer we wait, the worse, pro you know, the bigger, uh, the bigger the... <laughs> The hole that we dig for ourselves to get out from under. So we, you know, carbon taxation is another thing we need to have immediately. Uh, about 70 bucks a, a ton, growing around one and a half percent, and that would bring in a bunch of revenue for us, and re enough revenue really to make those who are having to, you know, who are being hurt by this carbon tax actually better off. Uh, so there's a way we could, you know, leave, leave the the you know, redistribute from people in the future are going to be benefited from this carbon tax we put on today to those who are around today who have to bear the burden of it so that everybody can be better off. This is what, I mean, there's, economics is incredibly magical science. It's got great power if you know how to use it. It's like, gee, how could you ever build the, the Washington uh, uh, bridge over the Hudson, right? The George G.W. Bridge over the Hudson. That's magical. I mean, that's, that's like a vac developing a vaccine. Every every profession has magic that can bring to the table. Econ economists have magical solutions that can save us money and save the country, and we're not using them. We know how to build that damn bridge across the river. Just let us do it and get yeah. the politicians out of the way. 
Right. Well, uh, Dr. Kotlikoff, where can people find out more about you and about the books that you've written and then um, a little bit more about your mission? Sure. Well, kotlikoff.net is uh, the best place. You'll see all, everything I write, I post there, all the academic papers and also columns. I write a lot of columns and, and books. And then I also, uh, people, you know, at a personal level, we have to find shelter from the storm financially. So uh, I've developed over the last 28 years through my software company that I have on the side, a, co a pro program called Maxify.com, M-A-X-I-F-I.com. It's a personal financial planning software tool that helps people figure out how to handle their finances in light of the taxes and including possible tax increases and social security benefit cuts. But also just in general, how do you, given where you, what you're earning and what you've got in the 401k, how do you manage your finances so that you don't starve when you're older or that you don't oversave? How do you get a smooth ride? So economics brings to the table an entirely different way to do personal financial planning than uh, the, the industry, which is interested in selling products. So, so I write a lot about personal finance and I have this tool that is also kind of um, featured at the website. So I think there's a lot of reason to go to kotlikoff.net and, and take a look around. Okay, very good. Well, Dr. Karlikoff, it was an honor having you on our show and uh, thank you very much for your time. David, my pleasure. Anytime, okay? Okay, sounds well. great. Alrighty, bye-bye. Okay, folks, that was the second half of the interview with Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. I think you can see that there is uh, lots of reasons to fret for the future of our country from a fiscal perspective, uh, but there's also some solutions on the table that if implemented soon, and we can only, I suppose, cross our fingers on that. If they are implemented soon, if there's some uh, politicians who uh, have some leadership that want to step up to the plate and make some tough decisions, there is still hope for our country. Um, note that he said that there could be a Great Depression in 2030, but there could be one as soon as tomorrow. He said these types of things happen fast uh, and they're not as predictable as you might think. So uh, again, if you are looking for help, uh, implementing principles that could safeguard you against uh, dramatically higher taxes in the future, head over to davidmcknight.com. And if you are a financial advisor who wants to help protect your clients and prospects from the impact of higher taxes, uh, head over to powerofzero.com. Thanks for being on the podcast this week. We will look forward to chatting with you same time next week.